Awesome. That went smoother than the first one. That was great. Mike, thank you so much for coming back on to talk about the uh, Great Fet One and some of the neighbors. And I think this is really applicable because, you know, for a lot of folks out there, they may be familiar with the dark ages of, say, Wi-Fi, when there was WEP and WEP was bad. So we all got hardware that could do broad frame injection, we broke WEP, and then Wi-Fi got better. Right. Uh, and in many ways, you've been developing hardware that helps us audit the Bluetooth and make the Bluetooth better or whatever have you. And, and, and now with the Great Fet One as an extensible platform, I, I see already the demo that you're setting up makes me like very excited talking about infrared. Having seen what, say, Woody was doing a couple of years ago with identifying yep. phones and things of that nature, but there hasn't been as much research as I know that there should be and will be because a lot of it comes down to accessibility and having the right tools for the job. So I see what you're doing here. I see the power of this as a platform now because rather than make a one-off tool for every different variety of, of IO under the sun that you want to start attacking, today being uh, infrared, you've built a platform for that that utilizes all of the power standing on the shoulders of giants on your computer and GNU radio. Am I, am I on the right track here? I think so. And you know, a lot of my background as I was getting into building hardware tools really came from software-defined radio. And I, I was building software tools for doing wireless uh, security communication, uh, or I should say wireless communication security research um, before I got into developing hardware tools. And SDR is such a, such a game changer for uh, communication security because it gave people the ability to build radios in software instead of building them in hardware mm -hmm. and it enabled people to do all sorts of creative things to test radio systems or to rapidly develop radio systems and I'm today I'm showing something that lets us kind of bring that same sort of software defined radio technique to a different medium which is infrared it's an exciting medium too because you, you know you see like whether it's your inexpensive uh, uh, remote control helicopters or your television, it's it's everywhere and it's been something one of those things that you've always taken for granted, mm -hmm. uh, and yet it is wireless. And one of the fun things is because you know it doesn't require going through all the rigmarole of, of uh, certification and testing and stuff to bring a product to market with it. You see a lot of stuff using infrared and a lot of proprietary ways yep. and like you said like without the tools to like be able to actually like okay it's one thing like on the data sheet practically speaking it says it's going to do this but how does it actually react in the real world exactly uh so we're going to do that now with the with the great fet that's right uh so this is a neighbor which is what we call add-on boards for the great fet project a neighbor for great fet that is in development now um, and it's pretty close to being done. It's called Gladiolus, that's the code name, mm -hmm. and it is a software-defined infrared platform. So similar to a software-defined radio platform, it does high-speed sampling of an incoming signal and mm -hmm. allows you to receive infrared signals, and it also can produce at high speed uh, outgoing samples and can transmit infrared. So it has both a receive chain and a transmit chain, and if you look closely at Great Fet 1 and you crack open a Hack RF and look at it, you might notice that they look very similar. The Great Fet actually is basically the digital side of a Hack RF. So all of, and, and this is kind but of- it, But is this not already analog? I mean, there's some ADC in here? To there is an ADC built into the, the microcontroller on Great Fet 1, uh, but we've actually put a much faster ADC uh, on the uh, Gladiolus mm -hmm. for, for this SDIR function or software defined infrared function. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, the reason why we made CreateFet the Great Fet one the way it is, is because we really liked the microcontroller that we used in HackRF and we found it to be uh, uh, super useful for all kinds of other things. Mm. Uh, but that means that everything we can do on a HackRF, other than the radio part of it, we can do with great fit. And so tacking on a, a, a different analog section sure. um, and a different set of analog to digital converters, for example, lets us implement something like software-defined infrared on top of great fit. And it has basically the same 
uh, digital back end that HackRF has. Okay, so now just talking about the kind of the, 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 the minutia of it, if I'm say a hacker that already has a familiarity with software-defined radio and maybe I've gotten like a, an expensive RTL SDR or something and I've played with GNU radio, I've watched some of the Hack5 tutorials and some of yours as well, and, and, or maybe I've played with the HackRF and done some transmit stuff, and so now I'm comfortable with that ecosystem, right? That whole world where, you know, you, your GNU radios and things of that nature. How does infrared hacking differ from that? That's a really good question. Um, the, uh, because infrared signals are fundamentally different than radio signals from the standpoint of a, a tool like this. Um, because when we're dealing with software-defined radio, we have the ability to manipulate a range of frequencies. Yeah. And we can distinguish one frequency from another. And of course, a frequency is inversely related to a wavelength. So, so one frequency is you know this long it's a this wavelength, meter is divided by and a, another frequency. The speed of is, light. The higher frequency is a shorter wavelength, right? Yeah. Well, well, with, with infrared, infrared is it not that way? with infrared, we're dealing with wavelengths that are incredibly small. Yeah. Uh, and so we're we're dealing with wavelengths that are about one micron. Uh, not when we're dealing with radio, of course, we're dealing with waves that are often in the range of centimeters or meters, meters or yeah. even tens of meters or more. But, but with infrared, the wavelength's around one micron, which wow. is super, super small. So you need to have like a much higher sample rate to be able to capture that. You would think that. No? But we really don't have the ability. We don't have like analog to digital converters that work at terahertz of frequency, which is what we would need yeah. in order to exactly emulate what we're doing with software-defined radio. So it's radio. not a one-to-one. -one. It's not one-to-one. -one. But what we have is diodes. We have LEDs, light-emitting yep. diodes, that can produce infrared. And we have photodiodes, which are, which are detectors of infrared. And so we use a certain, a special type of diode to detect infrared and a special type, type of diode to produce infrared. Now, they operate on a particular frequency or a range of frequencies uh, or wavelengths or colors, you might think mm. of them, because this is near the visible mm -hmm. spectrum. So a wavelength is equivalent to a color that your eye might see. Uh, and uh, instead of giving us the ability to manipulate individual wavelengths, we're actually just like when we receive with, with gladiolas, we're actually capturing a, wa a range of wavelengths. And the diode is basically just giving us the overall amplitude detected. And so it's kind of like, ah. it's kind of like an AM radio. It's doing an amplitude demodulation it is for us. Is that and then we're sampling that okay. instead of sampling the direct wavelength itself. Yeah, so that brings up two major questions. The first one being, in your typical ecosystem of infrared type devices, one, uh, is there certain bands or frequencies, or as you said, colors that typical things use? Like, oh, most TV remotes may use you know this color, we'll say, right. uh, whereas, you know, these vending machines or, infra or parking meters or whatever have you use these. Uh, and then also, do they typically use, like, I mean, amplitude modulation to speak or on-off keying or what, what, what's, the, what's the modulation techniques that they, you see there? They do use something like, uh, they do use on-off keying much of the time, but they also use different modulations. Um, however, Every single modulation they use is sort of built on top of modulating the amplitude of the light. And so uh, RFID is kind of an interesting uh, equivalent here too, because if, you, if people are familiar with RFID hacking at all, um, an RFID system works by, um, by fairly low frequencies in the, in the radio, uh, in the RF spectrum, mm -hmm. um, but it works by inductive coupling, not by like a long distance radio transmission. Right. So, and so mm -hmm. the way that a signal is detected is by the amount of, like the amplitude of a, um, a radio signal that gets coupled into this loop of wire. And RFID systems sometimes use more sophisticated modulations like like frequency shift keying or phase shift keying mm -hmm. 
but it's a modulation that's layered on top of the amplitude modulation. So you actually get like double modulation. Right, right. The physical layer is really amplitude modulated, but then on top of that sort of AM signal, there is carried an FM signal or a phase modulated signal. And infrared kind of works the same way it, where the, the basic tools we have available to us, these emitters and detectors of light, or in this case, infrared light, uh, they only give us the ability to manipulate an amplitude, but so we that's can a manipulate a, uh, a higher layer modulation on top of that amplitude modulation. So it really comes down to kind of the deficiencies of the hardware. Like this, this is the Absolutely. best we're gonna get out of these diodes, so right. that's what we go with. Exactly. And, and you were asking about uh, different wavelengths. Mm -hmm. There's there's kind of a wide spectrum of in, things that wavelengths that we call infrared, and they can loosely be divided into what's known as the near infrared and the far infrared. And the near infrared is called near because it's very close to the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the far infrared is further away from the visible spectrum. Okay. And pretty much every data type of infrared system, anything that carries information, is implemented in the near infrared in a fairly narrow band of wavelengths. Mm. Uh, the far infrared includes things like uh, the wavelength of CO2 lasers. Um, that are used for like cutting things. Okay. Uh, like you'll commonly see that in a laser cutter, for example. Um, and far infrared is also used in motion sensors uh, because humans, like our body heat, just makes us emit uh, light in the far infrared spectrum. And so it's used in like burglar alarm motion sensors. But for pretty much any system, like a remote control, sure. anything that's transmitting data over infrared, those are all in the near infrared, and it's in a fairly narrow band but of you can wavelengths, and we can collect them all with one photodiode. Okay. So you can kind of think yeah. of it in, like, in terms of like, oh, all the key fobs are all either 314 megahertz or 433, and it's, it's all pretty close. Right. But where they differ, even though they all kind of fit into the same wavelength of light, yeah. where they differ is in the modulation, uh, like they'll have some kind of carrier frequency of how fast they pulse that light. Mm -hmm. The most common that people might be familiar with would be things like TV remotes um, or remote controls for all kinds of things like toys or uh, ceiling fans mm -hmm. or what have you, uh, that most, most of which operate with a 38 kilohertz carrier and from the standpoint of a, a radio person, it looks like on-off keying of a 38 kilohertz carrier. But there are other infrared systems that are much more diverse than that. And in the past, we've had tools uh, available to us, like low-cost tools, things that you might plug into an Arduino, for example, sure. for interfacing with infrared things. Um, generally, those types of tools we've had in the past just focus on things that uh, use a 38 kilohertz carrier. But there's a much more broad range of infrared systems out there today. And I think you've talked to Woody about uh, some, of, some of those things, like the uh, infrared detectors right. that are built into mobile phones, which are fingerprintable. Those That's don't fantastic. generally have a 38 kilohertz okay. carrier. And so you have to do something different than use an off-the-shelf infrared receiver module uh, like like you, your TV has to detect its remote control. You have to do something like software-defined infrared to capture those things. We've found all sorts of interesting uh, infrared systems in the world since we've started playing with this device. There are... Oh. A, a, it's terrifying and wonderful too because you know mostly it's like it's not something that you one you don't you don't expect it to even be a part of an attack surface because it was, oh, it was right. an afterthought oh it's infrared and a lot of people went with it because oh we're not to bother with certification and this cheap it's cheap and easy uh, but also well, one of the things that makes it cheap and easy is you don't have typically bidirectional communication which means you typically don't have challenge and response right. which means typically a, re a replay attack is a replay attack <laughs> right <laughs> you know. We've, we've seen all kinds of different infrared systems that we didn't even know about before we started uh, playing with this platform. Uh, there are 
uh, infrared systems for like pairing digital micro uh, wireless microphones. There are infrared oh, yeah. systems for for uh, traffic signal preemption. There are infrared systems for audio. Actually, a lot of infrared audio systems, oh, like, yeah? like uh, automotive um, video systems, oftentimes have an infrared transmitter so that you can use these infrared wireless headphones in your car. Um, and uh, there's this there's this really sophisticated uh, system called Integris that is a uh, that we've seen deployed in, in like large theaters or lecture halls that it's often used for simultaneous translation where this system actually encodes up to 32 channels uh, digitally um, of uh, like digitally encoded audio 32 channels all modulated over a uh, carrier frequency that's in the two to five megahertz range mm. and allows uh, people like in an audience to all have a little receiver device with some headphones and tune into the, the channel that they want to. And like you said, that, that infrared system uh, has the benefit that it didn't have to go through any like radio uh, certification um, and that's one of the reasons, probably, that the manufacturer used infrared instead of radio yeah, for that. Also, for that particular application, it's just a one to many, so it's not it like is. you have to worry about a back and forth. I mean, I've seen like some cool research with LiDAR or whatever the the, the you know the light version of Wi-Fi. Right. But you know, it, it's it's a best effort protocol over a shared spectrum. Yeah. This is the same kind of thing, but you typically don't see bidirectional in this, which, for security researchers like us, makes things actually a lot of fun. Could be. Yeah. I had no idea that there was that much uh, that much application to it, and also that much bandwidth. I mean, I'm just yes. imagining 32 digital channels. Like, you know, what is the equivalent here to you know? Uh, um, at, at the same time, too, it's not like they can use QAM 128 kind of modulation to be able to uh, to cram all that data into the airwaves. Like, well. Actually, they can yeah. use those types types of modulation. Oh, for real! But only because they're they're Pulsing the LEDs in in the with carrier frequencies in the megahertz range, like these are wow. radio frequencies, yeah, uh, well, low radio frequencies that are implemented over infrared, and that's why we you, you need something like Gladiolus uh, in order to capture those. You need something that does very high speed sampling. And uh, so we've implemented uh, at least so far 10 mega sample per second. Uh, sampling and that allows us to capture things like wow. like those high frequency infrared systems. That's wild. So what does it look like? If, okay, so you break it out, you get you get the the, the neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, pop it on, and now they they become best friends. Right. Uh, you showed us last time how to get started with the you know the Python framework and, and all of that. Now I want to start using some additional tools. What does it look like then? Do I get an IR0 uh, uh, interface on my computer, you know what I'm saying? Like, like right. how, do I, <laughs> how do I talk to this thing? <laughs> so, so far, what I'm doing for development is, uh, is either th using a GNU radio source block mm -hmm. or implementing a named pipe to just pipe data over uh, into GNU radio or into some other tool. Uh, so, what we have so far is a fairly um, simple command line tool that lets us just specify a sample rate and specify an output file and start streaming samples. And I'm piping those into a name pipe right now, um, but we have a, a GNU radio source block in development. Mm -hmm. In this case, all I have to do is make a file source in GNU radio that, that picks it up, that sure. pulls the data out That's of that beautiful. pipe, oh. and that lets me start experimenting with GNU radio right off the bat without <laughs> having to worry about my, my uh, experimental uh, block yeah. working yet. Yeah. Um, and then I have this whole GNU radio flow graph, which looks basically like I'm decoding on-off keying. Uh, I'm, I'm pulling a channel out of it, in this case a 38 kilohertz carrier, so that I can do uh, detection of a remote control. And then I'm actually doing a correlation uh, to try to find a, a button press. And what this looks like is I have up on the top of this GNU radio flow graph window, um, I have actually the raw signal that's coming from that okay. analog to digital converter. So this isn't a waterfall, but this is a... Right. And so if I push buttons on a remote control nearby, uh, you can see those peaks 
those individual peaks that you see in the top, mm -hmm. those, those kind of shark sure. tooth looking things, those are actually the individual pulses of the 38 kilohertz carrier being produced by this remote control. So you can see like the, the nuances of the curve of an individual pulse because it's only a 38 kilohertz carrier, but I'm sampling at a way higher frequency than that. So uh, I actually am like zoomed in incredibly uh, in, incredibly tightly onto this 38 kilohertz waveform. But then in the bottom of my flow graph, you can see actually the result of kind of a decoding function. And you'll notice that- oh, It's doing that in real time. It's doing that in real time. And if I push a certain button on the remote, that one, do you see how I have this green line across the top here? Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. says there's a burst, a burst uh, T and F, that's like the start and the stop of, a, of what's called a burst. Uh, this is actually the result of a detection function that I have where it's detecting the particular button oh, that I pressed. Oh, nice. Right? So you've actually gone and, and figured out the signatures for these. And that's entirely done in software. It's all done in GNU radio, just like I would detect a particular code being transmitted by uh, an on-off keying radio system. Hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. There's so much, so much possibility there. And then, at this point, you could basically learn every key on that remote. If you wanted to, like, you know, recreate this remote, right? Sure. Uh, then how would you transmit it? Well, I can take a file that I've captured um, and, and just play it back uh, over the transmit side. Uh, now, similar to software-defined radio, you might have issues if you just capture a file and then try to replay it without modifying it in any way. You might have issues where like your captured signal is really weak mm -hmm. and your transmitting isn't going to be powerful enough. Uh, so it's helpful to have some kind of visualization like like I'm having good radio right now that lets me um, that lets me kind of validate that I'm using this dynamic range of of yeah. my system and potentially actually modify that data once it's stored uh, so that I can like transmit it at maximum amplitude. Domain.com has all of your website needs from .com and .net to intuitive website builders. Create your online identity with their affordable, reliable tools. Even brand yourself with over 300 extensions from .club to .space. Domain.com loves Hack5, which is why you get 15% off domain names, hosting, and email when you check out with coupon code HACK5. When you think domain names, Think domain.com. Sure, and tweak it to your heart's content. Right. Uh, is there like an equivalent uh, for, of a waterfall? Could you like walk around and see like, oh, what does the IR in this area look like? And sure. And does it work in a similar kind of way that radio does where you see like the whole spectrum, like, like oh, from here to here, this is what's Absolutely. over time being transmitted. Right, except as I mentioned earlier, instead of showing you a spectrum of frequencies that are that are different carrier uh, wavelengths over the air, what I'm really seeing is different frequencies of modulation of that carrier. Uh, so I'm kind of one step removed from the physical waveform that's going over the air. Uh, but I can still s differentiate uh, in the frequency domain between systems that use 38 kilohertz and something else that uses 60 kilohertz, mm -hmm. something else that uses a different frequency. I might have two remotes that are both nominally 38 kilohertz, but one of them's like 38 and a half and the other one's 38 and a quarter. And in software, I can actually differentiate between the two of them, where as a more traditional remote control receiver wouldn't be able to differentiate it between the two of them. We had this, this funny thing that happened when, uh, when Dominic Spill and I were first working on this project. Uh, our, our very, his very first hardware pl platform before I designed Gladiolus was a really simple add-on with a photo transistor and a resistor plugged into a crate bed mm. um, and just using the internal EDC. And, and he captured something and he was on his way to New Zealand and he sent me a capture file uh, for me to help him analyze. And I looked at this file and, I, and we were talk, talking about it after he was in New Zealand and, and I looked at this file and I told him exactly what I found in it. I was like, yeah, he, he, I think he was trying to detect fire. Uh, and so like, the, oh, cool. The, so he was, I was like, oh, you're using a lighter because there's these bright sparks yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that are like uh, super high frequency, super high amplitude uh, uh, sparks. And, and then I could see the fire, the flame after that. But I also told him, oh, you captured this 
at the lab in Colorado before you got on your flight to New Zealand, didn't you? And you said, yeah, how did you know that? Interesting. Cause I knew that because I found, when I was looking at the spectrum of the data in this file, I found that there was some light source, some ambient light source in the room. And I don't know whether it was uh, overhead lighting or maybe his computer monitor or something, but there was some ambient light source that I noticed was being modulated like unintentionally at a rate of 60 hertz. Oh, there you go. And we That's have 60 how... hertz mains power in yeah, the US yeah. and they have 50 hertz in, in New Zealand. New Zealand, right? so you're like, dude. So I basically, you're... I found this side channel That's cool. in his <gasps> capture file that reveal what country he captured that in. Wow, that's bizarre. I mean, if you, there were like burglar alarms too, and you knew the signature of that, you'd, you'd you know, maybe mm -hmm. even be able to tell those particular units. That, the research on this stuff is only starting to scratch the, the, the tip of the iceberg when, when Woody was on a couple years ago talking about how like, you know, the, the infrared sensor in your phone, the proximity detector, so that when yep. you put your phone up to your head, it turns the screen off has a unique signature, it was yep. like, why would it be unique? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like even in manufacturing tolerances, variation, like still there's no, anyway. Uh, Not only is that unique, but oftentimes the other side of the of the phone has, has an infrared detector for autofocus of a camera. Yeah. What do you just, there's just so many crazy possibilities with this, and uh, I'm just so excited to see that both the hardware is maturing, the software is maturing, and, and that you've developed basically a platform where you could do that kind of rapid stuff, and then if you wanted to, you know, put on a, a, a daffodil here and throw on some buttons or whatever have you, you could proof of concept something, take it out into the field, you know, this is just running off USB power, right? Right. Yeah. Now, are are any of the things where, like, if I wanted to make, like, a simple replay attack where I'm like, ah, look, I can crash your, your cheap toy helicopter, right? Could I do that on the actual Great Fet, or would I have to bring my PC with me? If I wanted to do a denial of cheap toy helicopter attack. <laughs> uh, the easiest way out of the box is just to plug it into your laptop and then be able to do a prototype that way. Yeah. Uh, but we are working on ways to make it easier for people to uh, kind of take their great fed on the road and do standalone types of things. Um, and uh, one of the things we're doing is we have a neighbor in development called Jasmine uh, that is a lipo battery uh, charging neighbor. Uh, so you could have a, a great fed with a Jasmine's and then a Gladiolus stacked on top of that, and then you'd have a standalone platform. Um, and uh, Generally, we we uh, we try to promote the peripheral development model with Great Fat, uh, but we, what we hope to do in the future is to also enable uh, taking things that you've prototyped as a peripheral connected to your laptop, uh, and, and then um, giving you a, a little bit of an easier path to take that prototype and turn it into something standalone. Yeah. Oh, that's where the true power of this is. This is crazy to see. Like, I mean, this uh, you've has only just now dropped this, and I'm seeing like half a dozen uh, neighbors in development. You know, be them 2.4 gigahertz or, or, or infrared or, or breadboards here, or what you talk about. With the there's so many more of these, and and I'm assuming because of the open hardware nature of this, that means that people that are interested in getting involved in the project and see like, oh my God, that's an application where I can like you know, utilize the ease of the, your Python framework and the, the great fat in of itself uh, that they could just, okay, cool, this seems like a, I mean, there are two 40 pin connectors and a couple of pins and whatever you want in between, right? Right. And uh, we've already seen actually neighbors being developed by people other than us. Uh, we of course have multiple neighbors in development, but, uh, but there are some folks who are making neighbors of their own and uh, that's a lot of fun to see. Dude, it is just epic to see like a new ecosystem being born in hardware hacking. I know going back a couple of years that, that you have had the concept of this modular design, be it jawbreakers or candy apples or whatever. whatever. <laughs> Not candy apples, hang on. Help me out here. I don't think we had that one. We didn't have the candy apples, but, there, but, the, but the, the modular nature of like how HackRF was born exactly. with that. It's so cool to see it come into fruition this way. Yeah, I think this is really accessible too, especially with the Python. So the uh, so the HackRF is an interesting example because we, you know, it was it made sense to make HackRF a single a single board, a single platform that's smaller and lower cost and more portable and lower power uh, than we could achieve with a bunch of boards connected together. 
But during development of, of HackRF, it was highly beneficial to go with a modular approach so that I could swap out different parts of it uh, and try different, uh, different approaches to designing different sections of the board. So for people who are developing hardware or interfacing with other external things and experimenting with entirely new hardware platforms, mm -hmm. the modular approach really makes a lot of sense. Totally, and I love how you know it's it's something that we're more familiar with as well. Uh, you know, having uh, grown up with Arduinos and things of that nature, uh, that have those um, that modular nature. But you're taking it a completely different step, using it from the aspect of like, hey, this is a peripheral for your computer. Your computer is really powerful. Right. You're running GNU Radio on your computer, not an Arduino. Um, right. So being able to have kind of the best of both worlds in that case is really powerful. I'm so excited for this platform. Can I show you uh, my favorite board from the Great Fit Project? <laughs> Please. This is a circuit board called the Wiggler. <laughs> it has it has zero uh, zero electronics on it. Oh, there, wow. there are no copper traces on this. Oh, board. I can't even imagine the bomb. This <laughs> this tool is a lever so that you could wiggle neighbors off of, of your great fat or off of one another. It's, the, it's, it's a, such an important thing because with all of these pins, there's a lot of friction. It, yeah. it adds up quickly. Hey, you know that time you bent a pen. And everyone who's ever worked with something uh, that's like a stack of boards has probably experienced this problem where you, you connect the boards together, they go just fine. But when you pull them apart, you bend pins. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we ship a wiggler with every great fit <laughs> so that you can easily wiggle your neighbor off of your great fit. You know, it's one of those things you didn't know you needed until you had it. Kind of like the Lego brick remover, yes. you know? And then your dentist is really happy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were one of those. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> this is fantastic, and it's just stupid cute. I love that you keep all of this stuff stupid cute, too. Uh, so, thanks. dude, thanks for coming on and, and show. I, I can't wait to see how this evolves. We're going to have to have you on, uh, you know, remotely, if not in the Bay, again, to, to see. Because there seems like there's a lot of momentum behind this right now. I, I popped on the wiki, and this has only been out for... No, a couple months, weeks. couple weeks. Yeah. yeah. And I saw like the list of like a dozen different uh, uh, open source um, um, uh, add-on boards. Right. And I'm like, wow, already. So that's really cool. Uh, so anyway, if people want to get involved and find out more and start playing with uh, infrared with a um, the Great Fet, uh, where can they go and find out more about the platform? Check out greatscottgadgets.com uh, or find me at Michael Osman on Twitter. And uh, if you're interested in software-defined infrared in particular, uh, there have been a few talks given by myself and Dominic Spill uh, at various events over the last couple of years uh, that you can find online uh, where we've done some interesting infrared uh, hacking using the Gladiolus platform. Nice. Please send me those links. We'll put them in the description below because now you're down the rabbit hole. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, M Mike's been, we've been friends since before Great Sky Gadgets was a thing, bringing to market the uh, original uh, Ubertooth one. So, of course, you can get this gear at uh, shop.hack5.org or from any of Mike's awesome distributors all around the world. So, greatscottgadgets.com for that. Uh, with that, we've got some fun, exciting stuff coming up, a bunch of new hardware, a bunch of new payloads, uh, so stay tuned to the channel. Uh, and Mike, dude, thanks again for coming on. It's thanks for having me. Yeah. With that, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Michael Osman. Trust your Technolust. <laughs> <laughs>